Python web applications. Deploy your script as a Flask app. You wrote a Python script that you're proud of, and now you want to show it off to the world. But how? Most people won't know what to do with your .py file. Converting your script into a Python web application is a great solution to make your code usable for a broad audience. In this video course, you'll learn how to go from a local Python script to a fully deployed Flask web application that you can share with the world. By the end of this video course, you'll know what web applications are and how you can host them online, how to convert a Python script into a Flask web application, how to improve user experience by adding HTML to your Python code, and how to deploy your Python web application to Google App Engine. So now that you know what you're going to cover in this course, let's get started. Brush up on the basics. In this section, you'll get a theoretical footing in the different topics that you'll work with during the practical part of this video course. What types of Python code distribution exist? What a web application is? Why building a web application can be a good choice? How content gets delivered over the internet? What web hosting means? And which hosting providers exist and which one to use? Brushing up on these topics can help you feel more confident when writing Python code for the web. However, if you're already familiar with them, then feel free to skip ahead, install the Google Cloud SDK, and start building your Python web app. Bringing your code to your users is called distribution. Traditionally, there are three different approaches you can use to distribute your code so that others can work with your programs. Python library, a standalone program, and a Python web application. You'll take a closer look at each of these approaches next. If you've worked with Python's extensive package ecosystem, then you've likely installed Python packages using pip. As a programmer, you might want to publish your Python package on PyPI to allow other users to access and use your code by installing it using pip themselves. After you successfully publish your code to PyPI, this command will install your package, including its dependencies, on any of your users' computers, providing they have an internet connection. If you don't want to publish your code as a PyPI package, then you can still use Python's built-in sdist command to create a source distribution or a Python wheel to create a built distribution to share with your users. Distributing your code like this keeps it close to the original script you wrote and adds only what's necessary for others to run it. However, using this approach also means that your users will need to run your code with Python. Many people who will want to use your script's functionality won't have Python installed or won't be familiar with the processes required to work directly with your code. A more user-friendly way to present your code to potential users is to build a standalone program. Computer programs come in different shapes and forms, and there are multiple options for transforming your Python scripts into standalone programs. Next, you'll see two possibilities. Packaging your code, and building a graphical user interface. Programs such as PyInstaller, Py2App, Py2Exe, or Briefcase can help with packaging your code. They turn Python scripts into executable programs that can be used on different platforms without requiring your users to explicitly run the Python interpreter. To learn more about packaging your code, check out using PyInstaller to easily distribute Python applications. Or you can listen to the Real Python podcast episode, Options for Packaging Your Python Application. While packaging your code can resolve dependency problems, your code still just runs on the command line. Most people are used to working with programs that provide a graphical user interface, commonly abbreviated to GUI. You can make your Python code accessible to more people by building a GUI for it. There are different packages that can help you with building a GUI, including Tekinta, WXPython, and PySimple GUI. If you want to build a native desktop-based app, then check out the learning path for Python GUI programming. While a standalone GUI desktop program can make your code accessible to a wider audience, it still presents a hurdle for people to get started. Before running your program, potential users have a few steps to get through, they need to find the right version for their operating system, download it, and successfully install it. Some may give up before they make it all the way. 
Because of these barriers to entry, it makes sense that many developers build web applications instead. These can be accessed on a browser which most systems will already have installed and it makes your application truly cross-platform. The advantage of web applications is that they are platform independent and can be run by anyone who has access to the internet. The code is implemented on a back-end server where the program processes incoming requests and responds through a shared protocol that's understood by all browsers. Python powers many large web applications and is a common choice as a back-end language. Many Python-driven web applications are planned from the start as web applications and are built using Python web frameworks such as Flask, which you'll be using in this course. However, instead of this web-first approach, you're going to take a different angle. After all, you weren't planning to build a web application. You just created a useful Python script, and now you want to share it with the world. To make it accessible to a broad range of users, you'll refactor it into a web application and then deploy it to the internet. It's time to go over what a web application is and how it's different from other content on the web. Historically, websites had fixed content that was the same for every user who accessed that page. These web pages are called static because their content doesn't change when you interact with them. When serving a static web page, a web server responds to your request by sending back the content of that page, regardless of who you are or what other actions you took. On screen, you can see an example of a static website at the first URL that ever went online. And if you follow the link seen on screen, you'll also be able to see the pages that it links to. Such static websites aren't considered applications since their content isn't generated dynamically by code. While static sites used to make up all of the internet, most websites today are true web applications which offer dynamic web pages that change the content they deliver. For instance, a webmail application allows you to interact with it in many ways. Depending on your actions, it can display different types of information, often while staying in a single page. Importantly, it also shows your email to you and someone else's email to them. Python-driven web applications use Python code to determine what actions to take and what content to show. Your code is run by the web server that hosts your website, which means that your users don't need to install anything. All they need to interact with your code is a browser and an internet connection. Getting Python to run on a website can be complicated, but there are a number of different web frameworks that automatically take care of the details. As mentioned earlier, you'll build a basic Flask application in this course. In the upcoming section, you'll get a high-level perspective on the main processes that need to happen to run your Python code on a server and deliver a response to your users. Running a web application In this section of the course, you'll see what's needed for a web application to run. Firstly, you'll take a look at the HTTP request response cycle which powers web applications, and then you'll take a look at hosting, which is needed for your application to work on the internet. Serving dynamic content over the internet involves a lot of different pieces, and they all have to communicate with one another to function correctly. Here's a generalized overview of what takes place when a user interacts with a web application. Sending. First, your user makes a request for a particular web page on your web app. They can do this, for example, by typing a URL into their browser. Receiving. The request gets received by the web server that hosts your website. Matching. Your web server now uses a program to match the user's request to a particular portion of your Python script. Running. The appropriate Python code is called up by that program. When your code runs, it writes out a web page as a response. Delivering. The program then delivers this response back to your user through the web server. Viewing. Finally, the user can view the web server's response. For example, the resulting web page can be displayed in a browser. This is a general overview of how content is delivered over the internet. The programming language used on the server, as well as the technologies to establish that connection, can differ. However, the concept used to communicate across HTTP requests and responses remains the same and is called the HTTP request response cycle. Flask will handle most of this complexity for you, but it can help to keep a loose understanding of this process in mind.
To allow Flask to handle requests on the server side, you'll need to find a place where your Python code can live online. Storing your code online to run a web application is called web hosting, and there are a number of providers offering paid and free web hosting. When choosing a web hosting provider, you need to confirm that it supports running Python code. Many of them cost money, but this course will stick with a free option that's professional and highly scalable, yet still reasonable to set up. Google App Engine Google App Engine enforces daily quotas for each application. If your web application exceeds these quotas, then Google will start billing you. If you're a new Google Cloud customer, then you can get a free promotional credit when signing up. There are a number of other free options such as Python Anywhere, REPL.it or Heroku that you can explore later on. Using Google App Engine will give you a good start in learning about deploying Python code to the web as it strikes a balance between abstracting away complexity and allowing you to customize the setup. Google App Engine is part of the Google Cloud Platform, GCP, which is run by Google and represents one of the big cloud providers, along with Microsoft Azure and Amazon Web Services. To get started with GCP, download and install the Google Cloud SDK for your operating system. For additional guidance beyond what you'll find in this course, you can consult Google App Engine's documentation via the link seen on screen. The Google Cloud SDK installation also includes a command line program called gCloud, which you'll later use to deploy your web app. Once you're done with the installation, you can verify that everything worked by typing the following command into your console. You should receive a text output in your terminal that looks similar to the one seen on screen. Your version numbers will probably be different, but as long as the gCloud program is successfully found on your computer, your installation was successful. With this high-level overview of concepts in mind and the Google Cloud SDK installed, you're ready to set up a Python project that you'll later deploy to the internet, so let's get started with that in the next section. Build a basic Python web application. Google App Engine requires you to use a web framework for creating your web application in a Python 3 environment. Since you're trying to use a minimal setup to get your local Python code up on the internet, a micro framework such as Flask is a good choice. A minimal implementation of Flask is so small that you might not even notice that you're using a web framework. The application you're going to create will rely on several different files, so the first thing to do is to create a project folder to make sure everything is in the same place. Create a project folder and give it a name that's descriptive of your project. For this practice project, call the folder Hello App you'll need three files inside this folder, as seen on screen. Main.py contains your Python code wrapped in a minimal implementation of the Flask web framework. Requirements.txt lists all of the dependencies your code needs to work properly. App.yaml helps Google App Engine decide which settings to use on its server. While three files might sound a lot, you'll see that this project uses fewer than 10 lines of code across all of them. This represents the minimal setup you need to provide to Google App Engine for any Python project you may launch. The rest will be your own Python code. Next, you'll take a look at the content of each of the files, starting with the most complex one, main.py. Main.py is the file that Flask uses to deliver the content. First, you import the Flask class. Next, you create an instance of a Flask app. After creating the Flask app, you write a Python decorator called app.root that Flask uses to connect URL endpoints with code contained in functions. The argument to app.root defines the URL path component, which is the root path in this case. The next code makes up index, which is wrapped by that decorator. This function defines what should be executed if the defined URL endpoint is requested by a user. Its return value determines what a user will see when they load the page. Note that the naming of index is only a convention. It relates to how the main page of a website is often called index.html. You can choose a different function name if you want. 
If a user types the base URL of your web app into their browser, then Flask will run index and the user will see the return text. In this case, the text is just one sentence. Congratulations, it's a web app. You can render more complex content and you can also create more than one function so that users can visit different URL endpoints in your app to receive different responses. However, for this initial implementation, it's fine to stick with this short and encouraging success message. The next file to look at is requirements.txt. Since Flask is the only dependency of your project, that's all you'll need to specify. If your app has other dependencies, then you'll need to add them to your requirements.txt file as well. Google App Engine will use requirements.txt to install the necessary Python dependencies for your project when setting it up on the server. This is similar to what you would do after creating and activating a new virtual environment locally. The third file, app.yaml, helps Google App Engine set up the right server environment for your code. This file requires only one line, which defines the Python runtime. The line shown on screen clarifies that the right runtime for your Python code is Python 3.9. This is enough for Google App Engine to do the necessary setup on its servers. It's worth checking that the Python 3 runtime environment you want to use is available on Google App Engine. At the time of creating this course, Python 3.10 was the latest release version of Python, but Python 3.9 was the latest version available on Google App Engine. You can use Google App Engine's app.yaml file for additional setup, such as adding environment variables to your application. You can also use it to define the path to static content for your app, such as images, CSS or JavaScript files. This course won't go into these additional settings, but you can consult Google App Engine's documentation on the app.yaml configuration file if you want to add such functionality. These nine lines of code complete the necessary setup for this app. Your project is now ready for deployment. However, it's good practice to test your code before putting it into production so you can catch potential errors. Next, you'll check whether everything works as expected locally before deploying your code to the internet. Testing locally. Flask comes packaged with a development web server. You can use this development server to double check that your code works as expected. To be able to run the Flask development server locally, you'll need to complete two steps. Google App Engine will do the same steps on its servers once you deploy your code. Firstly, set up a virtual environment, and secondly, install the Flask package. To set up a Python 3 virtual environment, navigate to your project folder on your terminal and type the following command. This will create a new virtual environment named VNV using the version of Python 3 that you have installed on your system. Next, you'll need to activate the virtual environment. Here's how you do it on Mac OS and Linux. And here's how it's done in Windows, which is subtly different. After executing this command, your prompt will change to indicate that you've now operating from within the virtual environment. After you successfully set up and activate your virtual environment, you're ready to install Flask. This command fetches all packages listed in requirements.txt from PyPI and installs them in your virtual environment. In this case, Flask will be installed alongside any packages that Flask depends on. Wait for the installation to complete, then open up main.py and add the following two lines of code at the bottom of the file. These two lines tell Python to start Flask's development server when the script is executed from the command line. It'll be used only when you run the script locally. When you deploy the code to Google App Engine, a professional web server process, such as Green Unicorn, will serve the app instead. You won't need to change anything to make this happen. 
you can now start Flask Development Server and interact with your Python app in your browser. To do so, you need to run the Python script that starts the Flask app by typing the following command. Flask starts up the development server and your terminal would display output similar to the text shown on screen. This output tells you three important pieces of information. Firstly, a warning that this is Flask's development server, which means you don't want to use it to serve your code in production. Fortunately, Google App Engine will handle that for you instead. Secondly, the URL where you can find your app. It's the URL for localhost, which means the app is running on your own computer. Navigate to that URL in your browser to see the code live. Thirdly, press Ctrl C to quit. This line tells you that you can exit the development server by pressing Ctrl and C on your keyboard. Follow the instructions and open a browser tab at 127.0.0.1.8080 as seen on screen. You should see a page displaying the text that your function returns. Congratulations, it's a web app. Note, the URL 127.0.0.1 is also called the local host, which means that it points to your own computer. The number 8080 that follows after the colon is called the port number. The port can be thought of as a particular channel, similar to broadcasting a television or radio channel. You've defined these values in app.run in your main.py file. Running the application on port 8080 means that you can tune into this port number and receive communications from the development server. Port 8080 is commonly used for local testing, but you could also use a different number. You can use Flask Development Server to inspect any changes that you make to the code of your Python app. The server listens to changes that you make in the code and will automatically reload to display them. If your app doesn't render as you expect it to on the development server, then it won't work in production either, so make sure that it looks good before you deploy it. Also, keep in mind that even if it does work well locally, it might not work quite the same once deployed. This is because there are other factors involved when you deploy your code to Google App Engine. However, for a basic app, such as the one you're building in this course, you can be confident that it'll work in production if it works well locally. Once you've checked your setup and the code's functionality on your local development server, you're ready to deploy it to Google App Engine. And that's what's covered next.